Good morning. Good morning. Bill? Good morning, everybody. Now, we are already late, but we are ready to start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege uh, to, to moderate a panel on Southern Caucasus. Uh, I think it's a very important topic, and we have a very, very distinguished panel you know, of experts uh, today, and uh, I will start immediately. I think that many things have changed since we met last time, six, six months ago. And we had the same panel uh, in the previous Baku forum. So it would be very interesting to know what has changed, what pitfalls we have, you know, what successes we have. And I would like to give the floor to Deputy Foreign Minister of Azerbaijan, Elnur Mamedov, uh, just to give the, 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 the first in, insight what's going on, uh, because Azerbaijan has uh, show the, the readiness to be the leaders in this process uh, and they are not afraid of leadership and they have the vision and we heard in the, in the speech of uh, President Ilham Aliyev you know, that uh, the process has started. Mr. Mamedo, the floor is yours. How do I put this on? Is it on? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to greet everyone in Azerbaijan and I am privileged to be on a, such a distinguished panel today. Let me start with passing on very warm regards from my minister, Jehum Bayramov, who is unable to attend this panel. And thank you for the question. Um, I think in a nutshell, we could illustrate the very significant developments over the last six months and I would try to present them in a, in a little bit of structure to make it easy to digest. So the first thing that, is, that has happened over the last six months in terms of the stability and um, prosperity in this region is that direct contacts between Azerbaijan and Armenia have been established. In April, there were first direct phone calls between the foreign minister of Azerbaijan and foreign minister of Armenia. That has not happened in the last 30 years. It's something that we should emphasize. The second thing that happened, we finally agreed on the composition of the delimitation commission. That was following the meeting among the leaders of three states, brokered by the European Council President in Brussels on April 6, where one of the important steps was to agree on a composition, on the fact that there would be a commission to delimitate the border between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. The other agreement that was made, where we're still waiting for Armenia to reciprocate, is to agree on a composition and final set up the commission to work and elaborate comprehensive peace treaty, a document that would normalize the relations between Azerbaijan and Armenia. As President Aliyev expressly said, after the end of the Second Karabakh War, we see South Caucasus as a region which would prosper, which would be secure, reiterated by His Excellency President yesterday, is to, for three countries to closely cooperate. And for that to happen, we have to normalize relations following the unlawful armed aggression by Armenia against Azerbaijan. So that's a starting point for us in order to bring prosperity and, and peace uh, to this region. Of course, uh, it's not an easy path. Um, we expect that Armenia would finally show a more consistent approach in terms of walking the talk and delivering on the promises that have been made over the last few months. And once that happens, the vision that Azerbaijan has brought to the table just after the Second War, we would be able to start working on concrete initiatives and putting this all into practice. So our vision in a nutshell would be for three countries in the South Caucasus to cooperate directly, to make sure that the region turns into stable, secure, and prosperous one. And, but 
for the Armenian aggression, we would have been able to achieve this long time ago. And I think our relations with Georgia is a very good example in terms of the projects that we've been able to implement in the last 15 years, be it the infrastructure projects, be it oil and gas pipelines, be it the transportation uh, hubs and transportation and logistic projects. And this is all due to the unique geopolitical situation of the South Caucasus, which provides for quite a, a, quite a set of advantages that we need to benefit from. And for that to happen, we need to make sure that there are no territorial claims by Armenia against Azerbaijan. And that's one of the five basic principles that we advanced uh, as Azerbaijan to Armenia to be the bedrock of the future peace agreement between the two states, which are, we would delimitate the border, we would make sure that we have mutual respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as the uh, inviolability of internationally recognized borders of two states, to work on the uh, um, opening of transportation and uh, regional communications, and finally make sure that Armenia would refrain from the use of force or threat of force against Azerbaijani sovereignty in the future. So the obligation and commitment that we expect Armenia would take unequivocally so that we could be able, so that we could turn the page of conflict and work on, uh, uh, on the future uh, of the South Caucasus. So I think these are in a nutshell the major developments over the last six months, and I'll be happy to elaborate as, as, we, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there are two parallel trilateral processes uh, complementary to each other, and now I, I, I'm giving the floor to Eka Tekashvili. You know. uh, do you see the, uh, the place for the third trilateral process? which will be including all three Caucasus countries and the role of Georgia. How do you see the role of Georgia? My mic is working, right? Uh, yeah. Um, I want to greet the audience today as well and then privileged to be in the panel. I want to say a few words of appreciation for us to have uh, a representative panel really at this very important discussion because South Caucasus for many years perhaps um, did not really generate and attract as much attention at international forums and I'm not speaking here at Baku as it deserved based on the importance of this question and I think that against the backdrop of what is happening now with invasion of Russia into Ukraine there is more and more I would hope attention and thinking to the whole region and including the region of South Caucasus that is given by, by um, foreign actors as well, looking into how much stability, prosperity, and development of a region of South Caucasus could be the way of ensuring larger stability when it comes to the larger region of the Black Sea and then region encompassing, I would say, Central Asia as well. Because we see there is a lot of movement right now, and we'll speak more on the economic aspects of that in the second round of interventions perhaps, but they, they, we are part of a bigger puzzle. But what is important now with the development that we see for the last past six months, that we have a chance as a region to emerge in the way that we might have our own agency as a region. because. That was, was the, we, we, we've been deprived of that. We've had uh, great uh, bilateral initiatives that had a chance of be becoming more of the larger regional and global initiatives and some of them materialized like that. And specifically when it comes to strategic initiatives of Azerbaijan and Georgia related to the you know, transportation of oil and gas and then you know, the trade routes as well, we've, we've tried to emerge as a regional dimension and the importance of that to be to have have strengthened but as a region we've been fragmented for obvious reasons when it comes to the conflict that and occupation of Azerbaijani territories by by Armenia for a long time so what we have now is a hope that I would expect not just hope to materialize into something real when it comes to settlement for peace and stability in the future the role of Georgia could be very important in this direction. And as much as I'm aware of, Georgian government expressed its readiness to host trilateral talks in this direction. 
if only there will be willingness from all three <laughs> to participate. Uh, I know that the uh, government of Azerbaijan is uh, uh, very much willing to be part of that discourse and then to be part of these considerations. But this is a momentum for us to think strategically into the future, to be aware of opportunities that we might have now, maybe for the first time for a long time, even after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, that we have as a region now to emerge and retain our own or gain our agency as a region. But at the same time, we need to be wary of the challenges as well. And then the challenge as a fundamental challenge still remains to be the same as it was for many years, decades even. And that's, uh, that's Russia. Russia that has a vision of our region as a fragmented region, region that has exploded after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the mines that have been planted previously for that by the Soviets. And then to see that if they divide, they can better conquer. So this is our responsibility, all representatives of the region right now, to be committed to our own future and to have political courage to act on it, if I may say so in this regard. And finally, I would say people-to-people -people relationship. Uh, I know that it's very hard to do when uh, major issues are still unresolved. We have uh, faced the same problem with occupied territories in Georgia, and it's just 20% of our country is still occupied by Russians. But attempts to interrelate and then connect people that are on different sides and left with disconnect is important for preparation for the future. People-to-people -people relationship cannot resolve conflict, but they are needed for peaceful coexistence in the future, for the real chance of the peace to emerge. And in this case, as a parallel process to political negotiations, my own country could play that role as well when it comes to hosting and facilitating, if there will be possibility, uh, for reconnecting people as well, for that to build possibilities for the future, for those who are representatives of businesses, those who are representatives of the civil society, but at the end of the day, to be, to be ready for the momentum when we could do more together as a region. Uh, and when it comes to international actors, let's not forget that when it comes to attention to the security challenge of the region, when it comes to still remaining presence of the Russian forces on the ground, to which Georgia suffers the most at this moment, this remains to be a vulnerability when it comes to when and what can be done by Russia to undermine anything that can be positively developed. And that is why the occupation of Georgia as well in this case is something that remains to be an open wound, uh, not only for my country, I would say, but for the region as well. Because for stable, prosperous and secure region, uh, territorial integrity of Georgia as a restored territorial integrity is something that uh, is a strategic goal, I would hope not only for my own people, for my own country, but uh, for international community as well. Thank you. So we, we, we got some uh, insight of the Georgian role in, in, in creating the stability in the future in, in Caucasus, but uh, there is also a role of big three, you know, we have a lot of threes in this region, you know, uh, Russia, Turkey and Iran, and we have a representative, Hikmet Çetin, who was a former uh, foreign minister of Turkey. What's a, uh, let's say, what's a picture from Turkish side? Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, uh, let me say a few words at the beginning. We recognize all Soviet former republics before the world. We are the number one country because we decided to recognize them on the 16th of December 1991. The official decision of Soviet Union was 21st of December during the NATO ministerial meeting, the four days, five days before, including Armenia. At the beginning, the first president of Armenia, Des, Des Petros, Petrosian, was willing to find a peaceful solution. But he was under the pressure of, from both sides, from diaspora and inside the very radical Tashnak party. And uh, we tried quite hard to talk with him. We have close dialogue with him. He wanted to, but I remember one when we had meeting with him, 
Demirel, our Prime Minister, myself, and Elçi Bey in Ankara, um, we prepared it how to find a peaceful solution to the, to the problem. Of course, he was in the difficulties. Uh, one, about 10 minutes we have to talk privately. He told me that he is willing to do it, but he will not be able to go to Yerevan. They will not let him to enter to Yerevan, that radical party at that time. Then they started to occupy first Azer Force Karabakh. But they didn't st stop there. They go beyond Karabakh. They occupied seven rayon, the sub districts of, uh, of, of, Azer of uh, Azerbaijan. And uh, even the border was open between Turkey and Armenia at the beginning. But after the occupation of the 100% Azerbaijani territory, the seven rayon, we closed the border. But because we knew that if we could not solve the problem at the beginning, it will become com frozen conflict. This is example all over the world. For example, in Cyprus, now it's almost 40 years. Still, there is no solution. Uh, that protracted conflict, South Caucasus, in the past 30 years, we waited for Minsk group to find a peaceful solution, but it didn't work. They couldn't find any solution. Inevitably, at the end, Azerbaijan started to war and to, occupy, to, to, to get rid, to, to, to free Karabakh and the other region. There is now a, a realistic chance to achieve enduring peace, stability across the region, as we have always desired last 30 years. Normalization process Turkey initiated with Armenia is a part of a broader vision for a peaceful, stable, and prosperous in South Caucasus. Turkey and Armenia, I want to shortly to a few words, reciprocally appointed special representatives to advance the normalization process. They have they've had three meetings. The first meeting, in, first in Moscow, and two times in Vienna. They agree to continue dialogue without preconditions, aiming a full normalization in the region. Based on lesson of earlier attempts at normalization, it makes sense to opt for a gradual process and move forward step by step. We have close contact with high level with Azerbaijan. They know what we are doing and they supported what we are doing. Armenia seems to be quickly open the border. My personal view, I think it would be a good idea to open the border at the moment because it will give chance for Pashinyan because it has problem in, inside of the country. Maybe it will be important to go at that side, but it will take time. We, what we need in Turkey, of course, is good neighborly relations across the region. We need to build confidence, confidence and look beyond daily pressures of domestic politics. It is also important that Azerbaijan should move and they would do. Azerbaijan already supports our normalization process because, as I have said, we have close contact on the very high level, on the presidential level. They know what we do, we, don't know, we know what they do. And Azerbaijan, Armenia relations remain hostile that will not be conducive to Turkish-Armenian normalization. In fact, as we listened from the President yesterday, Aliyev, they have very important proposals and principles how to deal with the uh, uh, peaceful uh, settlement. 
And, and of course, the mis groups already dead because they, 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 could, they were not able to find any solution last 30 years. And Russia intervened during the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And now they have the peacekeeping forces there. I think they did not even inform the other, other uh, co-chairs, France and the United States. And uh, I think there is no any other solution to the problem. We need dialogue. And Armenia did not met the principle they agreed during the ceasefire. For example, now Lachin corridor between Armenia and Karabakh is working as open. But Zengezur corridor between Nashivan and Azerbaijan is not being done, is not open yet, which is very important to start because this is one of the principal things that they were already agree on this issue. And um, we, we, I think we, 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 as a Turkey, of course, we always had good, what, what, as President Haidar Aliyev said, one, two, na one nation, two, two states. We work together, and we, I think we need peaceful settlement economically, socially, in the region. That yesterday, I, President Haidar Aliyev announced that they need a cooperation between Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. I think we have to support that, and we have to work on this issue, because that will be very important for peaceful settlement in the region. Region has big potential, has big potential, but that potential should be used for the region. But first, we need peaceful settlement at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we heard, let's say, the future vision from Turkey side, but we have a representative from Russia, and Gennady Burbulis may be inform us about what, what is the view from Moscow and Moscow's role in, in the peacemaking processes here in Caucasus. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Well, I would have a real hard time today associating myself with the official standpoint of the Russian leadership. However, I have a fairly good understanding that the that uh, there have been profound preconditions established and yesterday mr president ilham alif has very clearly and categorically declared that we now have a, a brand new perspective, a brand new prospect uh, pertaining to the, the process of peace, the process of creativity and peacekeeping. And my position completely co coincides with his call. At the same time, I did remember how that in September of 1991, uh, we were over in Nagorno-Karabakh, my, myself, President Yeltsin, uh, State Secretary Burbulis, uh, President Nazarbayev, uh, and uh, at that time we, we were very naive and sincere, thinking that we will be able to lay some sort of a foundation for the mutual understanding and dialogue. It's been 31 years since then, 
we have we have had various types of tragedies and testing periods as well as pain and it is now here as we are in Baku at this forum that I feel the normal human feelings with regards to the fact that uh, there is a powerful there there is a the, there are powerful preconditions established for the future peace there are no barriers or inhibiting factors on our way i'm sure that the official russia will try to completely support the strategy even more so that mr lavrov is going to visit you next week he's going to meet with the minister of foreign affairs of azerbaijan he's going to meet with the president of azerbaijan and i'm almost sure that they will confirm and reconfirm these prospects at the same time i'd like to draw our attention dear colleagues to one of the to one of the items of our program and discussion it is called based on my experience human experience and political experience it has a very profound name it sounds as follows who can be honest who can act as an honest intermediary to ensure the development of relations on a new level in this dramatic tragic and very promising region nowadays just pay attention to how beautifully does this sound who can provide an honest uh, uh, who can act as an honest intermediary we understand that we, that we can come up we could have come up with dozens of men's groups we could have held uh, dozens of um, talks and negotiations we, but right now there is a foundation for all of these efforts to actually culminate in a thriving result this foundation is the ethics the conscience uh, in politics uh, this foundation is about the uh, integrity in politics and i believe that the re the the reconciliation which we all thankfully accept nowadays requires from all of us to perceive and understand that the call to dialogue and trust the call to peace making and peace loving uh, requires a very comprehensive preparation it's it is not enough to have decorations and protocols and intentions we need the integrity which cannot be reflected in or by any document but without this integrity we will not be able to advance forward moreover the threats and the challenges that we uh, are faced with um, in over Europe and on the global scale make me remember uh, about an outstanding document in human history and I believe that you will agree with me dear colleagues that this is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights it's article number one it's like a prayer all people get born uh, as free and equal in terms of their rights and they are endowed with conscience and 
conscience and they should treat each other in the spirit of brotherhood. We have the fundam we have the foundation for dialogues and mutual trust. It it is about the empathy or um, it, uh, it is about the understanding of mutual mutual indebtedness or debt that we have to, to pay each other. This is the ethical and spiritual dimension of modern day politics. Uh, this dimension is so um, weak and poor oftentimes uh, that I would even propose this kind of an idea to our leadership, to, to the leadership of our fund, of, uh, to, 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 to the leadership of our global forum. Let's try to plan a series of round tables of pra practicums both in Tbilisi over in Yerevan and of course here in almost native Azerbaijan where we could um, join our, er our efforts with modern day scientists and humanitarian activists that have a great understanding of the subtle texture of this dialogue uh, so we can learn this dialogue and let's not be ashamed of this purpose it's not sufficient to declare the dialogue it's not enough to um, to compile declarations we also need to learn this from each other and even more so from the specialists of spiritual and humanitarian practices i would be very thankful if we could uh, actually reflect this initiative on behalf of realize this initiative on behalf of our panel and indeed uh, yesterday president alif alif was so um, uh, has has actually spoken so calmly about the fundamental activity which has been underway that we only need to provide our assistance to this most important strategic activity of ours. We had some insight from Russia, a uh, very in interesting one, but uh, we have uh, also other big players which are interested in stability and prosperity of Caucasus region. And so I, I think the, the President uh, Rosen will, will give us uh, the European prospects for future of this region. Very happy to be with you. Now we're working. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm a great believer as the European Union. We are great believers of the future of that region. Just look at Baku. It's changing every year. It's modernizing, beautiful, free, open, integrating. Just look at the Baku Global Forum. Year by year, we're getting everybody who is anybody from the world. Business, political, religious leaders coming together, debating about believing in peace, but peace is only possible when nations think beyond borders, when nations cooperate, when they work together, when they innovate and do not shoot. And Azerbaijan is a great example of a country that is an engine for peace because it cooperates with the others, it works with the others, it modernizes, it thinks beyond borders. Being a great believer of the potential of the region, I also must say recently, for example, I talked to the CEO of Siemens. He was telling me, Mr. President, you know, if you want to be globally strong in the new world, you have to be regionally strong. And actually, if you look at the global economic perspectives, it's what happening. The world is regionalizing. European companies are trying to totally rethink their supply chains, but also the American, but also the Chinese are trying to do that. So that we're moving to a kind of a globalized, regionalized world where because of security of supplies, because of the totally uh, 
how should the server surprises and uh, uh, no transparency at all on predictability, for example, of global players like Russia, uh, you should rethink really the way you work. And here the trends, I believe, will prosper the region, but of course it is all linked to solving the instability, because there is no way to have strategic investment, prosperity, if you have instability. Instability was planted in the region from Russia. Frozen conflicts in Georgia, frozen conflicts in uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, frozen conflicts up to Moldova and Transnistria and uh, even Ukraine. A frozen conflict is a very convenient tool for somebody to keep neighboring countries dependent on a very low cost. You just implant a frozen conflict, no strategic investments, no peace, no development, internal fights. Well, how convenient for somebody to control you. And unfortunately, that's the negative role Russia plays today in the region. So we need to solve frozen conflicts. We need to work for peace. Armenia and Azerbaijan, there is only one way to stop the war. And that's with the peace agreement. And that peace agreement should be not just another peace agreement, just remember the Budapest Memorandum or the Minsk agreements that, by the way, did not work. It has to be a sustainable peace agreement, agreement that really works. And the only way to do that, I think, was paved through also our debates today at the Global Baku Forum, through our meetings, but also our meetings with the President of Azerbaijan, where there is a full understanding that we need to integrate. We need to integrate Armenia. We need to cooperate with Armenia. We need to integrate a modernization product that, project that is beyond the borders. It has to be sustainable because of that people, businesses, cultures need to come together in order to create sustainable peace. And I'm a great believer. We can do that in the future, uh, because I also I believe that Russia's role in the region, which unfortunately is very destructive, will diminish as we see other regional players here. I want to thank really for Turkey, the role they played in the region uh, to solve a solution, to solve a dispute, a war, uh, I, I should say a conflict that was planted totally uh, in an unjust way for more than 30 years in Karabakh, uh, not keeping to three declarations of the United Nations, not keeping to, I don't know how many global solutions, decisions, please get out the occupation and make sure that a global order and rule of law is uh, guaranteed, but it didn't work. So now we see a sign of hope. What can the European Union do here together with uh, uh, countries uh, that are the United States, Turkey and others that are really willing to develop the potential in the region so that we have cooperation beyond borders, we have peace that could be lasting. Uh, of course, the European Union got some projects on the way, it needs to be more. Second, if you look at the global trends, how China, for example, linked its network with uh, Russia, but now it's hitting a wall because of the sanctions. I believe that China could be another very good partner to all of us to rethink trade routes uh, and we see very interesting new developments uh, here in the region because of the China rethinking supply chains to Europe, which is by far the biggest market. Second, what is also very interesting is that we see a trend that Azerbaijan continues to get best of the best from international know-how in the energy sector and works on the projects of the future, but that are regionalizing. So Azerbaijan is an engine of cooperation in the region, hydrocarbons, but also hydrogen, but also new wind opportunities from the Caspian Sea through Georgia, with Georgia, with Turkey, through Turkey, coming to the Europe. And those projects are projects for peace because they bring nations in cooperation and economic activity together. I'm a great believer that we can get those foundations uh, in a difficult time. We should not forget that we believe in peace. Peace should be preached, but we should work for peace, which is on all aspects of society, cultural cooperation, economic cooperation, religious, uh, and also, of course, um, geopolitical, very clear wind of regionalizing in a way coming together and yes we are going to have long-term troubles with Russia there is no hope that soon something will change there but probably one day as the Russian economy really will suffer very heavily from the decisions of the Putin's regime today somebody as a new reformer uh, would come could come should come 
we hope it will it is going to happen in Moscow uh, to uh, to start a new fresh wind of cooperation then we will be of course extremely happy to use that opportunity to have a lasting and a long-term peace but the region is on the right way let us get together and do our best and Baku and Azerbaijan here is a great example of the potential of the strength and of the future thank you Thank you, Rosen. And now I give the floor to expert on, uh, on regional economic cooperation, uh, Lazar Kamanescu. And what's, what's the future of cooperation during the militarization of, uh, of the Black Sea? Thank you very much. And uh, let me start by saying that uh, being the last to speak in this panel, uh, I see it as a big advantage because almost every uh, thing which is important has already been said. So that gives me the chance to be as brief as possible. Uh, well, but let me also uh, say that I'm, uh, well, it's always a pleasure to be back in, uh, in Baku and uh, an honor for me to be uh, besides uh, such distinguished personalities uh, in this panel, a panel which is uh, dedicated to a, I would say, very much welcome and well chosen topic. Why I'm saying that, uh, first of all, because it's about the uh, a, a, a geostrategic, extremely important geostrategically speaking, uh, part of our Black Sea area, wider Black Sea area. Second, uh, it's about, uh, when we talk about the South Caucasus, we are talking about a, uh, let's say, a, a region which over the years, uh, developments in this region uh, uh, over the years uh, offers us a lot of important lessons learned. I will not elaborate, they have been mentioned here. And very important as well, recently, the recent developments in this region is offering, uh, are offering us uh, reasons for optimism. And uh, uh, we have heard that we been very much, I personally, as Secretary General of the BISEC of the Organization for Economic Cooperation, I was much encouraged by uh, what I have heard yesterday from uh, President Aliyev and also from uh, our colleague here in the panel, Deputy Minister uh, Mamadov. So, uh, uh, and yes, not, 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 but, but not this time, really honored to be here in this uh, panel, all the more so as the three countries which you are talking about, they are, they've been most active uh, members of the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation. And they had really brought important uh, uh, contributions to whatever has been successfully so far in the BSEC. And I think that this organization has, has some important achievements. Of course, unfortunately, though we are this year in the 30th year of the organization we are, we are supposed to celebrate because of the uh, but because of the uh, of the unfortunate developments in the northern part of the region the war in ukraine will definitely have been affected but i still uh, hope that the wisdom and the reason will prevail so that uh, a solution to the conflict there would uh, would uh, find be found a solution which has to be fully in accordance with the international law. Well, with that hope, I think that as an organization, we can contribute to also through the economic development, because the essence of this organization is to promote and to uh, contribute to, this, uh, to confidence building in the region through economic concrete projects. And uh, exactly to this part of the, which I'm talking about, uh, you know, we've been trying in the region to develop some important projects, such, for example, a, a trade facility strategy. This is being finalized, and I, I hope that now with the new environment uh, which is being developing among the countries in the region, prospects for this uh, important project uh, uh, would be much more favorable. So uh, this is one point. Second point is, uh, I think that we are trying to do whatever we can so as to increase the awareness about the, uh, economically speaking now, the geostrategic importance of the wider Black Sea area and here the Caucasus. 
As yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, President Zulabishvili was referring to, we have to, and we are working as an organization, to increase the awareness of the importance of the three countries as part of an energy transport hub between East Asia, Europe, between South and, uh, and, uh, and North. So these are the, uh, a few aspects which I wanted to make, and you know, that, as I promised to be brief, uh, just one uh, additional aspect which I want to mention. The, our role as an organization is that we, we, we've been able, and we'll continue to do that under the umbrella of the BSEC, to bring together uh, uh, representatives from the countries in the BSEC, including the Caucasus, to talk bilaterally. And that's an extremely important point as well. And here comes, as Eka was mentioning earlier on, I fully agree that, you know, we are an economic organization. But we cannot, we are not looking, well, living in a vacuum. We have to take into account the general environment. And one aspect which I want to stress very much, is very important, is that related to developing, facilitating, encouraging people to people dimension. And just one very nice example which I, move, I, I want to give you. you no, know, one week ago I was in uh, Istanbul participating at, at an event dedicated to the 20th anniversary of the establishment of, the, of a uh, permanent mission to the BSEC of, uh, of Armenia and 30 years of, since the establishment of the organization. And I was absolutely, how, how to say, fascinated to see a, a hall of almost 1,000 seats full of uh, Turks, Turk, uh, Turkish citizens, uh, Armenians, and uh, citizens from all the Black Sea region. And it was an extremely important event where I think through music, because uh, the most important part of this, uh, uh, of this event was music, a, a concert, a classic concert by uh, uh, Komitas, an important uh, quartet from, uh, uh, from Armenia. And through that music, we, we, music is helping overpassing extreme, extreme difficulties as well. I wanted to, to mention that because it has been something which was organized also in connection with the organization I'm, I'm representing here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very practical advices. So I would like to give back floor to Elnor Mamadov. Uh, so with a few questions. The first one, we have uh, only three trilateral formats now to uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Russia, uh, European Union, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. How do you see these uh, trilateral formats you now to, to, to compl be complementary to each other to get the, to the result we all want? And the second is, uh, what do you uh, see as uh, accelerators of uh, creating these transportation uh, uh, corridors and uh, creating, as what was mentioned just now, you know, uh, the Caucasus hub? both of trade and energy. Um, thank you. With respect to the first question, the, the term that you use is the right one, which is complementary and not mutually exclusive. So you know that Russia brokered a very important trilateral statement back in November 2020 to end the conflict and has been uh, active ever since. The European Union, which mostly started its proactive initiatives back in December at the summit of Eastern Partnership countries and then was led by uh, President of the European Council, Charles Michel, in February, also with the participation of the French President. Then two meetings, one in April and the other one in, uh, in May, which solidified the agreements that had been reached earlier, but also provided for very concrete steps. And something that is important to mention also in terms of the Delimitation Commission, as I said earlier, it's important we honor the commitments that we take. The first meeting of the Delimitation Commission took place on May 24th, which was a very good demonstration of the will, of the will that is out there without any mediation on a state border between Azerbaijan and, and Armenia. Uh, 
also, in terms of um, other initiatives, the, the one that we're still waiting for Armenia to reciprocate is a state commission on working out the normalization treaty that would uh, allow us to uh, solidify the interstate, all the principles for the interstate relations. And there, of course, the European Union is, is active as well. And the initiative that we've been proposing to Armenia that Armenia has not yet accepted is to see this as a region where three countries of the South Caucasus should, should be in the leading roles and, and not in the complementary roles. And for that, of course, Georgia has to be in the picture. And Georg um, Georgian leadership also on previous occasions offered that uh, there would be mediation efforts that would take place in the territory of Georgia. Tbilisi was offered as a potential forum. Azerbaijan accepted that. And, and uh, as Excellency President Aliyev reiterated yesterday, that is our vision. We believe that for the region to go forward, three countries have to be in the leading roles and not on the sidelines of, of those discussions. And for that, we, we, we have to uh, have those agreements also involving Georgia in the picture, especially in the context of regional and transportation projects. So uh, in short, for us, the mediation platforms that are existing, they are complementary. They have unique roles in terms of bringing Azerbaijan and Armenia together. And again, uh, from the perspective of the future of the South Caucasus, we believe the normalization process going forward should also have um, Georgia as a, as a player uh, in, this, uh, in this process. For the second question, um, again, going back to the location of the South Caucasus, we're at the crossroads of the East and West. The East-West Transportation Hub, the International Transit Corridor, they lie through the territory of Azerbaijan and Georgia. They also, uh, the other corridor, which is North and South, also goes through the South Caucasus. You know that Azerbaijan um, has supported, since 2013, One Belt, One Road initiative that was proposed by China. And this is also part of the uh, important transportation uh, project set uh, should be taken into account while we're talking about the prosperity of the South Caucasus. This would uh, be, th this project could bring a lot of benefits to the uh, South Caucasus region. In the meantime, North-South in terms of transportation and logistics uh, would be the other important uh, international project that we should uh, bear in mind. The other thing that we we need to take a look at is the recon massive reconstruction works that Azerbaijan has started uh, right after the end of the second war in Karabakh, where, where uh, uh, President Aliyev signed a decree which established 14 economic zones in Azerbaijan, and two of them, Karabakh and Istanbul and Guzur, are in the formerly occupied territories. In 2021, in 2021, we uh, invested 1.3 billion USD in those territories, and this year we committed the same amount. So in total, it's now the number is 2.6 billion USD that are being invested in Karabakh to uh, revive the formerly occupied territories. The projects that were launched there, be it in terms of infrastructure. The international airport in Fizuli that was built in less than 10 months. Two more international airports that are being built in uh, Zengilan and uh, Lachin. One will be inaugurated in, in Zengilan uh, later on this year and Lachin in, in one to two uh, years. Also, you're well aware that we, we declared the liberated territories as green energy zone where we would be only using the renewable energy. Yeah, the potential of, uh, of that region is huge. It's 10,000 uh, megawatts in renewable e energy. It's mostly solar and, and wind. And I think this, this showcases the potential that Azerbaijan can bring to the table. And the only reason that Armenia has been historically isolated from all those projects where Georgia actively participated is the fact of the occupation. And that was our definition of the conflict throughout this period. The problem and, and it's in the bedrock uh, of the conflict is the fact of occupation. Now that we don't have the fact of occupation, we believe that Armenia as well can benefit from the future projects. And given that Azerbaijan accounts for more than 70% of the South Caucasus uh, total GDP, and in terms of the potential and budget that we own, uh, these, these are all practical and these are all feasible. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I, I understand we are much beyond the time limit, but uh, I would like to give the floor to the audience because we are missing the questions from the audience. If you have some questions, you ask the can panelists, I, just raise your hands. Chairman, can I say a few words? Sorry? A few words. Yes. You think about the questions and you yeah, well, have I the think floor. The role, of, the role of Russia is very important. They were, always, they were always in the region. Now they are militarily in the region as a peacekeeping forces. I think they will since they must sincerely support the peace process, the last treaty between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and also the, the regional cooperation, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. I think they should play positive and constructive role because they are important. They are in the region and now they are militarily in the region. And they, we have to deep militarize the region and the end of the treaty. This is very important for the region, for the treaty to, to, to mm -hmm. last forever. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the comment. Any comments or questions from the audience? Stand up and talk. Introduce yourself, please. I understand that Iran has a close relationship with Armenia. And uh, we are also very well aware of the concerns of other countries such as Israel about uh, nuclear proliferation. And what, do you, what does the panel think about the role that Iran plays at present and should play in a normalization of relations in the South Caucasus? Thank you. I think you know, the, the best person to answer this question is Mr. Mamedo. One of the initiatives that been brought up by President Aliyev and President Erdogan is a format of 3 plus 3, which actually includes Iran. So whenever we talk about the South Caucasus, it is not to send a message of any monopoly in the region. Exactly, the, to look at it from a broadened vision, the initiatives that have been brought up, and you know that the first meeting was held as part of a 3 plus 3, a 3 format, is to look at it not only from the perspective of the three South Caucasus states, but we bring into the picture Turkey, Russia, and Iran in order to explore those opportunities that are available and that would uh, have the intersex, intersection of common interests, uh, not only of the South Caucasus, but of the, uh, of the larger region. You are probably also aware of the important MOU that was signed between Azerbaijan and Iran in March this year. Um, which would provide the alternative route for Azerbaijan to connect to Nakhchivan through the territory of Iran, which would have the uh, roads and, and bridges as well as e electricity lines and fiber optic as well. And um, that project, I believe, is also a very good demonstration of the fact that it, Iran is not left out in any way. So uh, I do uh, understand that we've concentrated maybe too much on three states, but this is not to send a message that uh, other regional powers are somehow, are somehow left out. Thank you. Any more questions? If we don't have questions from the audience, I will like to thank, uh, do we have? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, in all conference, we talk about regional corporations. If you analyze the last five or 10 years, there is no any strategic plan for all these regional corporations. And all leaders, they think about their own country. There is no any values for region. If you take some countries, example, Iran, Afghanistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, all this country that we are neighbor. What's that the value that we can share with all these populations? And even we don't have a, a small center of research for development of this region. We, we want more with the United States, with some powerful country, but there is no a real plan for the regional development, how we can work together, how we can live together, how we do trade. In this way, what do you think? 
this is it's possible to have some regional cooperation? If yes, how? If not, what's your proposal? Thank you very much. I think it's the right question to Eka. Joe. Um, I think uh, for, for those who are not maybe uh, privy or initiated in depth uh, to, to the details of the troubles of the region, it might seem so that, you know, there could be talk about the regional developments, but what is it that actually is offered on the table? But what, we, what we've been trying to explain during the panel discussion uh, was, was exactly that, that we do have a new momentum because the new reality has emerged after the liberation of the occupied territories of Azerbaijan because what this region has been haunted as a hostage for so many years was that because of the result of the first war, which was, in my own opinion, very much a result of this planted mines of the Soviet Union to explode the republics after liberation from the Soviet Union, there was no real chance indeed for the development of the overall regional development. What we've managed in the region to develop was bilateral relations at that time, and then what uh, we, I can say and attest to the importance of development of the bilateral relations between Azerbaijan and Georgia, they indeed had a regional and even beyond the regional dimension in terms of the impact when it comes to transportation, supply chains, and trade, and then discourse that was much larger than Caucasus per se, but encompassed Central Asia and then the Black Sea region and beyond Europe as well, with oil and gas and transportation and trade routes, including railways. But now we have a unique momentum because the opening is there. This unique momentum needs to be explored, and that takes courage, vision, and strategic understanding of what this window of opportunity is. But there are no guarantees, obviously, because the opportunity is just an opportunity if it is not realized. And all sides need to contribute to that so that the reality actually is a result of the kind that we would aspire by having indeed a regional development developed, the regional cooperation developed. It starts with building trust, it starts with resolving issues that still are open as a foundation for the peaceful coexistence and with the projects that can be actually mutually inclusive when it comes to economy and when it comes to people to people relationship. But as I've said previously and I still you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying in that opinion, uh, with that opinion still, is that we need to be aware of the challenges as well. And while we would all inspire for Russia to play a constructive role, I haven't seen Russia playing a constructive role anywhere so far that much in a sustainable way. So Russia's political vision and strategic vision of dividing and conquer, I don't think that it disappeared. There might be a moment that Russia now acts in this way that it acts, but we need to take this moment to be stronger and stronger as much as we can so that the developments are of the kind that even if Russia would want to destroy it, Russia will have no chance to do that. And then outcome of the war of Russia against Ukraine will have a great consequence, obviously, on the global scale. It will define the decades, really, for our future generations. So if Russia is successful in imposing that vision that invading other countries and occupying other countries and disrespect to international law can actually happen without any consequences. In my own country, in Georgia, I would fear what is the consequence of that when it comes to occupation of my own country. So how much that will contribute then to the regional discourse, I would say negatively rather than not. But if the never again to the military occupation is set to a larger degree uh, than uh, liberation of, of, of territories here in Caucasus, but then generally to say that it's not acceptable, then we have a better chance of sustainable stability at the regional level for a long time to come by exploring this opportunity now. Rosen, you want to add something? I want, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for that question. Uh, really a great question. Of course, there are examples for regional cooperation. Just look at the Southern Gas Corridor. We were so proud to work so many countries together. It's a huge success. It brings to all of the countries on the road to the Southern Gas Corridor prosperity, trade, uh, and it's a strategic project where actually it's saving <laughs> some countries today, even my country, Bulgaria, as Russia just stopped for a second the gas deliveries to my country, which is an act of economic war and energy war to us. It was the sudden gas corridor that is helping us, uh, pushing our economy further, giving us a hope. Thank you, Azerbaijan. That's great. But 
You said something very important, just last sentence. In my capacity as a member of the board of NGSC, I take your uh, thoughts and idea. And I think within the AGSC as the leading format for cooperation in the region, as a think tank, as an international organization, we will have a debate uh, about why not creating a kind of a regional NGO, regional institute, regional something that help us bringing the projects further for the region together. You're very highly invited to participate. Bring your thoughts. Be productive and positive. How we can really work together. Thank you. Just one question, uh, one sentence. Uh, uh, as a reaction to the uh, well-chosen question, if I may say so, by our distinguished uh, friend from the floor. Uh, yes, of course, the region is a region with sensitivities um, uh, in, the, in terms of relations, bilateral relations and not only. But there is something which I think is, has been there for good and it is uh, fortunate that it is there. Awareness of the importance of developing e uh, regional cooperation. And the Organization for the Economic Cooperation in the Black Sea area is the, the I would say, don't take me as kind of being too subjective or biased, but I, I would say that it is the best example about the fact that even if the most sensitive and complex environment in terms of relations between states, they, we've been successful, these states have been successful in, in setting up this organization and this organization uh, was successful in, in implementing some important projects with the contribution of all the countries. Bringing them around the tables is extremely important there. And by the way, the BSEC is, a, is not just the countries which are repairing to the uh, Black Sea and well, the 13 member states, but we have also the so-called family of the BSEC, which consists of observers and sectoral dialogue partners. And there is a, also the family consists of the BSEC related bodies. And coming to your question. The BSEC has the avails of an international center for Black Sea Studies. And this is dedicated exactly to help the organization in devising long-term projects and ideas. And I would recommend you to get in contact with this, uh, with this center. It may be useful. Thank you. Okay, we are running out of time. Now I would like to thank all the panelists for very clear messages and thank the audience who asked the questions and that's Give a big applause to our speakers.